I want to thank one of my patrons, RM, for drawing my attention to this case because I hadn't heard of it before. I've spent a lot of time reading Albert Rosales' guides, but he updates them so often that it's hard to keep up with everything he puts out. The case, which occurred in Kentucky, was originally reported to MUFON. It involves various types of entities interacting. Certainly not the first case of its type, but they are rare. I really wanted to go over it. It was November 1991. The witness, no name given, was the owner of a 160-acre farm in Falmouth, Pendleton County, Kentucky. It was around noon, so he and his friend had decided to go grab some lunch. At some point, a farmhand had informed him that some hunters had snuck onto his property. The farmer finished his lunch, grabbed his rifle, and started walking down the fence row, planning to cut into the woods and sneak up on them. He had been in the woods 45 minutes to an hour looking for them when something truly bizarre began to play out. As he was making his way through the forest, something stepped out from behind a tree just ahead of him. It was somewhat obscured by the foliage, and so the farmer raised his rifle and hollered out, friend or foe. He inched closer and received the shock of his life, for standing in front of him was a three and a half foot tall gray being. Suddenly he felt the being speaking to him telepathically. He sensed that it was a young female. She seemed scared. In his mind, he could hear her say that she was intending on running up a little knoll that was nearby. True to her word, she then turned and began running up that knoll as the farmer stood staring in shock. He kept his rifle trained on the creature, following it as it reached the top of the hill. As weird as that was, that was nothing compared to what would happen next. As he watched her, there was a flash of light. From there, something the farmer likened to a doorway or portal opened up in the forest. It was about four feet wide and probably eight feet tall. It was brightly lit inside and he could see the little being now standing inside of it. It seemed to be wearing a tight-fitting black suit of some sort. It hadn't been wearing this before. Then, out of the corner of his left eye, he noticed something running through the woods towards him. He wheeled around, and right in front of him was a, quote, lizard-like man, about five to six feet tall, holding a long, staff-like instrument in one hand. According to the farmer, the being's face was more insect-like, and it had blue eyes. While he couldn't explain why, he got the sense that this creature was the father or the guardian of the female entity he had just stumbled upon seconds earlier. His arrival, as unnerving as it was, would get even more bizarre when another creature appeared to the farmer's right, just standing there. He was a seven to eight foot tall hairy bipedal creature that the farmer referred to as a Bigfoot. The witness did not hear it speak, but in his mind very clearly, he heard the Bigfoot creature pleading with the other one. No, don't hurt him. Just then the lizard looking type creature looked right at the witness and his eyes changed to a yellowish gold color. Completely terrified at this point, the farmer turned to run, and when he did, he suddenly found himself standing in the woods alone. It was now nighttime. When he turned to run, it was still very much day, but now it was dark. How much time had passed. He remained standing there in complete shock for a period of time, trying to collect himself. He then made his way back through the forest heading for home. Upon arriving at his farm, he was told by a worker that men had been out looking for him for the past few hours, as they hadn't been able to reach him and assumed he had been injured. The farmer never told the men of his experience with the beings. What an absolutely fascinating case. If true, it provides some interesting insight into the visitors and their familiar interactions. I have heard of various races of beings working together, the greys and nordics, bigfoot-like creatures working alongside insectoids, etc. Though this case has everything, portals, greys, bigfoots, and even a sort of 
half-man, lizard, insectoid type entity. It sounds like the farmer had stumbled upon some kind of extraterrestrial family outing, one in which he may have actually frightened one of the creatures, a young female grey, and somehow telepathically picked up on her fear, as if she was simply projecting out her thoughts, and he somehow momentarily tuned into that frequency and internalized her fear and thoughts. In Pat Hancock's book, Haunted Canada 3, there is a rather bizarre story that was initially reported in the Alaska newspaper, The Gnome Daily Nugget, back in 1916, involving a mining engineer and an eerie prophetic dream he had, a dream that just may have saved his life. It began with a letter sent to an Alaskan woman by the name of Ethel Williams, from a man named Donald Mack thanking her for saving his life. Mac explained that he was a mining engineer who had spent the last few years touring locations in the thick, rocky backwoods of Canada and Alaska. Not an easy job by any standards. It was made even worse later in the year. Anyone who has endured the brutal, unforgiving winters in Canada and Alaska will attest to this fact. On this tour, Mac claims that he and several others have been crossing the frozen Tagish Lake heading towards Skagway. Tagish Lake is a long, narrow lake crossing the border between the Yukon and British Columbia. Mac was with three native men and a French-Canadian man. Together they slowly trekked the lake by sled. They eventually came upon a small island in the lake and decided it would be the best place to set up camp, as it was quite cold and night was fast approaching. After eating supper over a small fire, the men retreated into their tents and went to sleep. Don Mack claims he had an extremely vivid dream in which a young woman appeared to him. She identified herself as Ethel Williams from Syracuse, New York, and implored him to find another way across the lake. She insisted that the direction they had planned to go the next day was dangerous, that the ice was thin and would not support them if they attempted to cross it. When Mac awoke the next day, he found the other men were already packing and were getting ready to set off. Mac told them of his disturbing dream, insisting that they needed to find another way across, that it wasn't safe. The men merely laughed at him, brushing off his weird dream as simply that a dream, and nothing more. They set off on their way as they had planned. They assumed Mac would gather his senses and catch up with them, though Mac, still quite shook up by his dream, had other plans. Although it forced him to spend an extra few hours braving the cold alone, Mac managed to detour around the dangerous spot. He eventually made it into the town of Skagway. He was a little cold and tired, but okay. The same couldn't be said for his friends who had failed to arrive in town. Mac became quite concerned and was able to round up some locals to help him search for the missing men. It was discovered the men's canoe and gear floating in the icy waters not far from the spot Mac had been warned to avoid. The four men had fallen through the ice and drowned. Their bodies were never recovered. Back at his office in Juneau, Alaska, Mac a fairly wealthy man, used his financial resources to look into whether or not an Ethel Williams from Syracuse, New York even existed at all. To his surprise, it turned out she did. A young woman by the name of Ethel Williams lived in Syracuse, New York, and a photograph revealed her to be the same woman who visited Don in his dream. He didn't know how, he didn't know why, but he knew he needed to thank her. He proceeded to pen a lengthy letter detailing the incident and the prophetic dream. He also thanked her for saving his life. It is unclear who informed the reporters, but somehow details of Don Mack's experience and the letter made its way to the offices of the Gnome Daily Nugget, and in 1916 the story was published. Ethel herself was astonished when she read the letter, because she had never heard of Don Mack or Tagish Lake, I had no idea of the ice conditions on the lake at that time. 
She found the entire thing mystifying, as did Don Mack. Friends of Mack's for whom he had shared his experience, including the name and the location of the dream woman, were equally shocked when he did indeed actually manage to track her down. She existed. She was real. She even looked as he had described. How was that possible? Barbara Smith, in her book, Great Canadian Ghost Stories, noted that Don Mack passed away many years later due to natural causes. He went to his grave believing that he had been saved by a woman in his dreams. A woman who, as it turned out, actually existed in the real world. Thank you.